Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Talks in Class. I'm Jenna, thank you so much for joining me today for another conversation. I am back from all my travels, <laughs> my month of traveling or so it feels. And I gotta say, I am so happy to be home in my own apartment, back in LA. I had uh, quite the trip. <laughs> this last trip, I had just like the worst luck with flying, just frustrating, annoying situation one after another. So I went to my mom's a couple weeks ago. That was fine. All of my flights were actually great, which, you know, it's rare, but I got lucky that time. Came home and I was home for about a week, just a little over a week. And then I left to go to the East Coast. My husband was already there. He left a few days before me. And long story short, I had delays, misconnections, canceled flights, not just on the way there, but also on the way back. So both directions, I ended up having to stay the night in a hotel, both directions, and then flying the next day. I got there a day later than I expected and then got home a day later than expected. So it ended up being four days in total of flying and just being in airports and dealing with that. I have to give airport employees so much credit because people are just so high stressed in the airport, you know, like it's just a stressful environment. The flights are delayed and people, you know, flying is stressful in general. Travel is stressful. People have their families. Like I got to give these people credit because the airports were chaos and I cannot imagine having to deal with that. But thankfully they were very helpful. They were really nice. They put me in hotels. So I wasn't trying to sleep on the floor of the airport, but it was a lot of traveling and my trip did get cut short essentially by a day because I spent an extra day in an airport, but it is what it is. Not ideal for sure, but I made it home, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, and the three days that I did end up spending on the East Coast were super fun. We did a lot of stuff. We saw a bunch of people. We did a day in New York and we had beautiful weather that day and kind of got to go around to some of our favorite places and then spent time with my husband's family in Connecticut, did a little family Halloween party, which was super fun. And um, yeah, it was good, but I'm happy to be home. And you know what? I am ready to chill. I'm ready for a cozy November at home. I'm ready for that, you know? And I can't believe Halloween is over. I love Halloween, but I love Christmas season even more, honestly. So I'm ready. I'm ready for Mariah Carey season. Bring it on. Bring on the Starbucks Red Cups and the cheesy Hallmark Christmas movies. I love all of it. I will resist and I will wait to put up my Christmas decorations until hopefully Thanksgiving, <laughs> but I can't promise that I won't watch a Christmas movie before then. We'll have to see. So as always, I will start with my what good happened. And this week, my what good happened is that I got to spend time with my friend who just happened to be in town here in LA the same week that we were gone. So it really worked out well that this friend was able to come into town and then stay at our apartment and actually take care of Daisy, our dog. But we also got to spend a couple of days together before I left. Last Sunday, we had brunch with another one of our friends at like a cute outdoor restaurant. And then we went shopping and walked around and, you know, just had one of those friend days where you don't really have an agenda. You just like go to brunch and see where the day takes you. Those are my favorite days. I love days like that. So it was, it was good. It just worked out really perfectly with the timing. So for this week's episode, I am talking about one of my favorite topics, which of course is fashion trends, but not just any fashion trends. This week we are going to dive into the pop culture and the internet culture and the social media culture and the fast fashion that really shaped fashion overall, but certainly my own fashion sense when I was a young adult in the early 2010s. Looking back at past fashion trends is something that I have always kind of enjoyed doing. My friend actually recently sent me photos that she took of a scrapbook that I made for her when she graduated from high school. We grew up together, so I compiled a bunch of pictures from, you know, throughout the years of us and made this scrapbook. And I wrote little commentary by all of the photos. And a lot of the comments that I wrote by the pictures were about our outfit choices, which is so funny to look at now. She graduated in 2003, so that's when I made this, 20 years ago. 
And I have pictures in it from when we went to the Backstreet Boys concert in 1999. And my commentary about the pictures of the Backstreet Boys concert was something along the lines of like, check out those outfits, what were we thinking? But I never really thought about the timeline of it all until I started making this content. And obviously I spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff now, but like, how long does it take to go from this is the most amazing outfit I have ever laid eyes on. It is perfect in every way to being kind of sick of it, just a little bit over it, to absolutely hating it and wondering what we were thinking, to eventually coming out the other side and feeling nostalgic for it and almost wondering, like, when did we stop wearing this? Why did we stop wearing this? Where did this go? Because you don't really think about it while it's happening. It takes a while before you realize that was a trend and at some point it went away. And I don't have an answer for that exactly in terms of the timeline, but I don't think it is as long as I would tend to think, especially now with the trend cycles seemingly moving so quickly. But I think if you're in your 30s, you've probably been forced to confront these things now a few a few times. I mean, we've been through a few different revivals at this point. We've been through the 90s revival, which was the first one that kind of hit me in the face, like my middle school, late elementary middle school wardrobe popping up in stores was the first time that I realized I'm old enough that this isn't happening to me now. Then the Y2K, the early 2000s, like juicy uh, sweatsuits and, and platforms, those revivals have obviously brought up a lot of nostalgia. But similarly to how I eventually just kind of got sick of the trends when I was wearing them the first time around, I find myself feeling the same way about some of the nostalgia about these things for a while. Meaning it's really nostalgic when it first starts to come back and when people start to talk about it, it feels really exciting and nostalgic and I think it's because all of these memories are kind of resurfacing for the first time and we haven't thought about them. But after a while, it's like you've been beat over the head with it. I feel this way about Y2K right now. I'm so over Y2K, I don't wanna talk about it anymore, which is hard because this is my job. I'm a nostalgic creator. And I love the Y2K era. There's so many things about the fashion, objectively speaking, that I really like, but it's just so saturated our pop culture the past couple of years that I'm also over the nostalgia of it, if that makes sense. And lately, I've even found myself a little bit less interested in reminiscing on early and mid 2000s things, which is, always been my favorite because that was my high school experience fashion. That was kind of the heart of my adolescence. And instead I find myself feeling super nostalgic for the end of the 2000s and the early 2010s. And in terms of my own life experiences, the late 2000s and the early 2010s have I think a really special place in my heart because that was my young adulthood. I graduated college in 2010 and I started grad school in 2011. So I spent the later half of the 2000s in college, 2005 through 2010 were my college years. And then I spent the early 2010s as a grad student in a humanities program, which was perfect. I mean, absolutely perfect. Perfect could not be more aligned for being just absolutely immersed in the hipster thing that was going on in the early part of the 2010s. And then as a underemployed, overeducated 20 something year old with student debt and absolutely no real applied job skills to speak of whatsoever, <laughs> unless you count, you know, critically analyzing the representations of women in media on our cultural understandings of femininity and gender performance as a job skill, which most employers did not. This was my experience in the early 2010s of kind of trying to perform the role of an adult when I did not feel like one at all. And the early 2010s was the height in my mind of fast fashion, like true, cheap, quickly churned out fast fashion became kind of the norm then, at least in my experience, being a broke college student and grad student, this makes sense. But let's be honest, I mean, we were wearing absolute garbage quality clothes and they were extremely cheap, but also in a lot of cases, I feel like they were 
purposely very distressed and made to look like something that you might find in a thrift shop because those were kind of the trends at the time. But this was extremely convenient for me considering I was a highly broke young person who wanted to pretend that I was not highly broke. And I also wanted to follow the fashion trends because that's always been something that I liked. And I think that every time period has had multiple trending aesthetics happening simultaneously, but the very early part of the 2010s is particularly interesting to me in this way because looking back, there were a lot of really different things happening in fashion. And I think because of the rise of fast fashion, but also things like Tumblr and Pinterest and Instagram becoming really popular, where we could create and share things that would help us cultivate a specific aesthetic. There were all of these different styles that came into the mainstream where before I think maybe without those things, a lot of them would have stayed a little bit more under the radar or a little bit more countercultural. And all of these different aesthetics, you know, we had hipster, we had twee, we had boho, we had this soft grunge thing, we had preppy, we had girl boss, we had the swag <laughs> style. You could find all of them at the fast fashion stores. You could walk into Forever 21, Charlotte Russe, whatever, and they would all be there. And walking into a fast fashion store now is still like this. It's like you're looking at a million different stores in one place. But the early 2010s was the first time I remember really feeling this way when walking into a store. You'd walk into Forever 21 and see a whole wall of the, you know, Herb Leger knockoff bandage club dresses over there. And then a whole wall over here of, you know, peplum tops and pastel pale pink sandals with little bows on them and blazers. So unlike my teen years, I think, where you'd sort of cultivate your style based on the stores that you liked. You know, you were an Abercrombie kid or a Hollister kid or a Hot Topic kid or whatever. The fast fashion stores of the early 2010s were just a catch-all for trendy clothes, you know, air quotes, trendy clothes, because that could mean so many different things at that time. And I also think it's really interesting when I look back at not just my own style, but images of the time, people combined these different trending aesthetics in a lot of different ways. I feel like now people tend to curate a very specific aesthetic when it comes to their fashion. And maybe this is because we have this tendency now to label everything. So, you know, you could be like a cottage core girl or you can be like a old money aesthetic. I don't even know, but you know what I mean. There's all these different labels for different styles and people kind of put them in boxes and, you know, this is clean girl, but this is not. So like you have to wear what's in this box. And it wasn't like that when I was young. And it wasn't like that in the early 2010s when we started seeing all of these styles simultaneously pop up in the stores same stores all at once right i think what's really interesting about the early 2010s fashion is how much of the fashion at that time was really just an evolution of some sort of indie style that had managed to go mainstream and a lot of this i think again has to do with the internet but in the 2000s Indie sleaze and the Sienna Miller style, like early 2000s boho thing, and then later the emo and the scene kids, these styles did start out as sort of countercultural at least, but by the later half of the 2000s, I mean, you could walk into American Eagle and buy a boho skirt. You could go to American Eagle and buy that boho skirt and then go across the mall to the buckle and buy a gold disc belt to wear slung across your hips, and you could feel like you looked like Sienna Miller, except for you were shopping in your hometown mall at a store that everybody else shopped at. And then of course, once social media came into our lives in a really big way, I think with MySpace, especially emo culture really exploded, the scene culture exploded. And looking back, I just loved clothes, you know, like I loved everything. And it's funny because I don't remember ever giving any thought to the aesthetic that I was presenting with these outfits. You know, I wasn't trying to fit into a certain group or reflect my values or ideas through my clothes or identify with some sort of culture <laughs> or aesthetic with my clothes. I just liked all these different kinds of clothes, so I wore them. But I shopped at mall stores. I was not a cool kid, you know? I was not an indie thrift early adopter kid. I grew up in rural Wisconsin. I had American Eagle <laughs> Express 
and JC Penney. We were not on the cutting edge. Okay, we didn't have enough access at that time to even be on the cutting edge if we wanted to. But even by, I would say, definitely 2006, maybe 2005, a lot of kids were dressing in these emo styles or maybe kind of seen probably a fewer of those, but definitely a lot of the emo style. It just went mainstream in such a big way that I think Looking back, MySpace had a lot to do with it. it. It really coincided with the MySpace era. And the boho and emo kids of the 2000s MySpace era evolved into the hipster Tumblr young adults of the early 2010s. I would love to do an entire episode on the hipster movement of the early 2010s because I really find it so fascinating, not just from a fashion standpoint, although I could go on and on about that, but from a cultural standpoint too, because the 2010s hipster was such a paradox. By the 2010s, hipsterdom had gone mainstream, but the idea that it was rooted in was at least supposedly on some level a countercultural idea. It was kind of pro-indie, pro-local, pro-DIY, but by the early 2010s, it evolved into something that just felt so pretentious. I mean, it was it was elitist in a lot of cases, just beyond, beyond pretentious, and basically entirely driven by and also understood and presented through just consumerism, you know, stuff. You had to have the right hipster stuff to identify as a hipster. That's how we defined hipsterdom, you know, on the streets. You needed the right hipster clothes. You needed the newest iPhone. Apple was very hipster in those early years. You needed to read the right books, listen to the right music, drink the right craft cocktails or whatever. Never mind that those cocktails expertly mixed by the mixologist with all organic ingredients were $17 at the new hit bar in Williamsburg. They were so into being ironic that their irony just overtook their entire being. <laughs> and I was never a hipster, really. I, I can confidently say that I never dated a man with a mustache who brewed his own beer in his loft apartment in some gentrified neighborhood that he referred to as authentic. But the more self-aware, less insufferable, kind of less Portlandia versions of the hipsters were very much my friends. I had a lot of those types of people <laughs> in my orbit at that time. And I really did love the fashion. I think the fashion had so much to do with our understanding of the hipster movement, if you can call it that, in the early 2010s. So I guess I was somewhat hipster adjacent and I at least participated in it visually to some extent. But even within the hipster trend of the early 2010s, which was so big, I mean, if you are somebody around my age, that is almost the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of the early 2010s is hipsters in Brooklyn specifically. Like it was all about the, the Brooklyn hipster. It became such a running joke in culture. But even within hipsterdom of 2012. I feel like there were all of these various ranks and, and variations of the hipster. Someone should do a whole taxonomy of the hipster subtypes. You had the classic hipster, what I think of as the Brooklyn hipster. Suspenders, mustaches, dark denim cuffed at the bottom with some sort of weird Oxford shoe, hangs out at coffee shops, drinks craft beer, probably lives in Williamsburg, listens to vinyl, you, you know, that type of hipster. But then you had like the swag hipster, which was more of the ironic uh, hipster variation. It was the skinny jeans with Converse and maybe red lipstick, maybe red hair with a slouchy beanie. Definitely a lot of mustache memorabilia, maybe a PBR. They might have some version of scene hair still, except for rather than it being hot pink, it's now, like I said, red or maybe black. And then there was the twee segment of the hipsters, which was a very important segment. This was like the, the cutesy thrift Zoe de Chanel girls. They wore a lot of primary colors and mustard cardigans and skater skirts, a lot of big thick glasses that may or may not have been prescription, a lot of owls and birds like Portlandia put a bird on it. That was the twee hipster. Honestly, 
the existence of the show Portlandia, speaking of Portlandia, just goes to show how pervasive hipster culture was by the early 2010s. And also how it had become this running cultural joke that everybody was in on to make fun of the hipsters. I mean, everybody was was making fun of the hipsters, whether you lived in Brooklyn or the middle of the country. I mean, this was a national show. And Portlandia really did a good job of poking fun at so many different variations of, of the hipsters too, which I really appreciated. But anyway, back to my hipster taxonomy. Then there were the more crunchy kind of hippie hipsters. Their fashion sometimes looked a little bit like a religious cult, you know, like a, a linen tunic or a long denim dress or something. But you know, these types, it was Birkenstocks, everything had to be organic, early adopters of kale, kale for everything. And then there were also some sort of hipster adjacent types that I wouldn't necessarily classify as hipsters, but they were definitely within the indie thing. They were the, they were the hipster extended family tree. So they're like the third cousins of the Brooklyn hipsters, we'll say. You had the more Tumblr aesthetics, like the soft grunge people who listened to a lot of Arctic Monkeys and Lana Del Rey, Flower Crown, Boho hipsters. This whole thing was happening on Tumblr really big in the early 2010s. Or you had the very specific variety of the music festival EDM Boho hipsters who basically just wore a lot of different fashions that were versions of native cultures that they had appropriated and did a lot of drugs, I think. The, the, the early Coachella girls, basically. I feel like these could also be girls who really loved Kesha. That was kind of a subset. I will admit that from a fashion standpoint only, I really did love the whole boho thing that happened in the early 2010s, especially kind of that EDM mixed with Kesha. <laughs> vibe that was happening. I loved to mix something neon with something crocheted. That was that was a whole look that I really enjoyed. I am absolutely shocked if I'm 100% honest that I made it through 2012 without getting an arrow tattooed somewhere on my body, particularly on my forearm. Every girl had that arrow tattooed on her forearm and I'm shocked I didn't get it. But give me anything with fringe, feathers, tassels, leather, studs. I was all about all of that. I even wore headbands around my forehead. I was actually really into that for a while. I wore those longer than I should have. But I didn't pair them in a, like a full Coachella outfit. I paired them a little bit differently with other 2010s aesthetic items. My favorite thing was to mix kind of the boho look with the more soft grunge or like edgy look with something leather or studded. Actually, now that I think about it, it was all very Kesha <laughs> inspired, but I didn't realize it at the time. So I would wear my black skinny jeans with holes in the knees. Those were my favorite jeans for so many years with a long flowy muscle tank type shirt. You know, like they were always really like low cut in the armpits and loose. I remember I had kind of a light mocha beige colored one that said New York across the front in big black font. And I felt so cool in that. It was my favorite shirt. So I'd wear an outfit like that with a forehead headband and one of those gold necklaces with the little sideways cross on it. Do you remember those? Why were those so popular for such a moment in time? I felt so cool in that necklace. It had to have been probably late 2012, early 2013. I was all over that sideways cross necklace. And then maybe I'd throw like a fringed crossbody bag on it and a stack of bracelets. And that was, that was the look, that was the outfit. It was really always a mix of a few different aesthetics in the 2010s. And I feel like I did that a lot, especially looking back at pictures of my outfits from the time. If I look at my own style over the years, I can see really obvious similarities, even through very different trend eras. I definitely lean towards classic items with statement accessories. So a lot of basic clothing items with accessories that kind of give it personality. I do like styles that lean boho, but also preppy. And I also tend to like styles that lean like grungy. I don't know exactly the word. I guess that's the best word for it, grungy. Like graphic tees, leather, ripped, anything, like literally anything that's ripped or distressed, anytime that has been trending throughout the years, I am immediately all over it. And I really feel like the early 2010s was just one of the easiest times to mix different styles, but especially those types of different styles, because 
when I look back at the huge aesthetics that I remember, those are pretty much them. It's boho, it was preppy, it was grungy. And a lot of the pieces we had were also pretty versatile, I feel like. You could throw your green field jacket on. You know the one, the jacket. That green jacket from J. Crew or Gap or really just about any store in those days that we all owned and wore faithfully for pretty much the entire decade of the 2010s. The Bella Swan jacket, if you know that way. You could throw your green jacket on over a ripped graphic tee, tights with shorts and combat boots, and it would look perfect. Or you could pair your green field jacket with skinny jeans, riding boots, a sheer button down top, a statement necklace, and a big chunky infinity scarf. And it worked with that too. You could even wear it with a flannel, your dark jeans, Oxford shoes, and a big old owl necklace, and it would work. I mean, what a time to be alive and shopping at Forever 21, honestly. And although I will say that a lot of my favorite styles, obviously, as I have discussed from that time, were really inspired by a lot of the more indie aesthetics, the impact of the preppy girl boss aesthetic cannot be ignored. <laughs> when we talk about the early 2010s because this was the business casual era. It is interesting because there have been a lot of different iterations of the business casual as casual wear thing. In the Y2K era, in the very early 2000s, I remember we had girls wearing like low rise pinstripe flare dress pants with a shiny beaded backless shirt as club wear with like big platform shoes. And then in the later part of the 2000s, we got really into blazers. I had a, my first blazer, I think it was in 2004. It was a corduroy blazer from American Eagle. And then in 2005 or 2006, when I worked at Express, I got a brown velvet blazer, you guys. I felt so amazing in that blazer. So I was really primed and ready for the business casual thing in the 2010s. It wasn't necessarily new then, but I do think it was a lot more prominent. It was just inescapable by the early 2010s. And I do think a big part of this was obviously the economy, right? We were still very much living in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. So clothes that can do double duty make sense and are more appealing when people are hurting financially. But also just everything that was going on with internet trends at the time exploded this whole fashion aesthetic onto my radar for sure. Namely, the rise of Pinterest and fashion bloggers around this time. I don't know about anybody else, but when I think of fashion bloggers in, say, 2012, 2012 is kind of my, my go-to year reference point for the early 2010s. When I think of a 2012 fashion blogger, I have a super specific picture in my mind, and she is full-on preppy girl boss. She's wearing head to toe J. Crew, probably skinny jeans, expensive riding boots, maybe Tory Burch or those ones that were black. And then they had the band of brown leather at the top with some sort of like gold logo on the side, maybe a plaid button down or a chevron blouse, depending on the season. Definitely without question, a giant Michael Kors watch on her wrist and a huge statement necklace probably also from J. Crew, and then an armful of gold bracelets, chains, cuffs, a lot of gemstones, a lot of sparkle happening, and gold Ray-Ban aviators. Always, 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 always the gold Ray-Bans. Like this was the look of fashion bloggers at this time. In the summer, they all looked the same. Their color palette was mint green, navy blue, white, and coral, <laughs> which I thought was the chicest thing. I had ever seen. I mean, it made my, my brain explode. And then in the winter, it was like burgundy, navy, cream, and maybe hunter green. I mean, very like plaid color palette. And these were the first types of images I remember seeing on Pinterest when I signed up for it in 2011. My Pinterest boards were just full of motivational quotes, Ryan Gosling memes, and these outfits. I ate this up every morsel. I was obsessed. And also if I think about, you know, how this plays into my personal experience or how my personal experience plays into my obsession with this, I had just started grad school. I was really young still. I went straight from undergrad to grad school. So 
I was trying really hard to dress professionally, which apparently at that time to me meant just dressing like the fast fashion version of a fashion blogger with some alliterative blog title like cupcakes and cashmere or sea of shoes or polka dots and purses, <laughs> something like that. I mean, why do they all have these titles? Thankfully, the likes of Forever 21 had me covered when it came to all of my girl boss prepster fashion needs. In 2012 and 2013, I don't really think I shopped anywhere else except for Forever 21 and Urban Outfitters. Those were my only stores where I shopped and Urban was a splurge for me because I was broke. I had one of those sheer polyester button down shirts in almost every single color imaginable. I had mint green, which was my first one. I bought it at a boutique in Soho, New York. I had peach. I had beige. I had three different black ones, you guys. Three different black ones. A regular black one, a sleeveless black one, and a black one with like a rhinestone collar that would tie into a bow. <laughs> I had burgundy. I had olive green. I'm pretty sure I had navy. I mean, this was all I, I wore. When I was teaching in grad school, my go-to outfit was one of those shirts and my $12 dark denim jeans. I'm not kidding, they were $12 at, from Forever 21. And either a scarf that served no purpose or a giant plastic collar of a necklace that turned my entire neck and chest green by the end of the day. And I would walk into those classrooms to give my little Calm 1010 lesson feeling on fleek, as we said in 2016. <laughs> And while I am proud, proud to say that I never once wore a business casual outfit to an actual club, I did repurpose some of my professional outfits as going out outfits, as we all did. I had this mint green skater skirt that I used to wear with this lace tank top and a blazer with these giant platform shoes that I bought at TJ Maxx. I felt so cool in that outfit. I, I really thought that that was the greatest fashion concoction I had ever thought up. I also wore a lot of cardigans, like a shocking number of cardigans. I look back at pictures from that time and I, I had so many freaking cardigans. I'm wearing cardigans at school. I'm wearing cardigans at the bar. I'm wearing cardigans out on the weekends. It was cardigans all the time. I especially liked the ones that were kind of a dolman sleeve and slouchy without buttons. There's the open front ones that kind of were like, they were basically just a long shrug now that I think about it. I loved those. And obviously a lot of bandos underneath things and lace bralettes in various pastel colors and geometric patterns, all from Urban Outfitters or Forever 21. Speaking of the bandos, I mean, this was necessary because all of our shirts, the armholes were cut down to our rib cage. I mean, you had to layer. <laughs> it was mandatory. So naturally we had to pick a bando that added a little spice to the outfit that way. And there really just is so much that I could talk about when it comes to the early 2010s fashion aesthetics, but since I, I do need to stop talking eventually, I am going to end by giving you a few more reference points in case you are craving some visual examples of excellent, truly excellent early 2010s fashion. I present to you my top five favorite TV shows for early 10s fashion. Number five is Portlandia. Obviously this show is satirical, it is parody, but it's still a great example of 2010s fashion and some of the more normal characters are also represented, but it is of course mainly focused on the hipsters. And as I stated before, it does a really, really good job of covering a lot of the different subtypes of hipsters, which I definitely knew to some degree. So if you are curious about how various people who fancied themselves as indie dressed in the early 2010s, Portlandia is a great place to look. Number four is New Girl, obviously. Zoe Deschanel is unquestionably the queen of early 2010s twee fashion in particular, and New Girl was the blueprint for any aspiring indie thrift kind of bookish girl looking for fashion inspiration. I've literally never seen so many A-line skirts and polka dots in my entire life. 
Number three is American Horror Story Coven. I believe this is the third season and it is from 2013. This is not something that I would imagine would come to mind immediately when thinking of TV that represents 2010's fashion, but I recently rewatched this and there are some amazing 2013 outfits in this show. The thing that I really like about the fashion and the way that the fashion of that time is represented in Coven is that it's not smacking you in the face the way that like New Girl or Portlandia is. It actually feels like if you saw somebody wearing some of these outfits today, it wouldn't feel so strange. You maybe wouldn't think it looked that dated particularly Madison, obviously, and Zoe's outfits. Madison, especially, she has these like amazing skater skirts with tights, a lot of Jeffrey Campbell Lita platforms, things like that. But even some of the other characters have little subtle or not so subtle early 2010s outfits. There's one scene where the Marie Laveau character is literally wearing a chevron dress with a belt around her waist. So, I mean, you can't escape the 2013. Number two is HBO's Girls. This, I feel like, is the most realistic portrayal of what... 20 something white girls in a city like New York were wearing at the time. And I can say this because I was a 20 something year old white girl in New York at this time. And these girls on girls dress like my friends and I dress. And they kind of all have their own style. Like Hannah is a little bit more twee hipster. Shoshana is definitely the preppy Pinterest girl. Marnie's the girl boss. Jess is the boho free spirit girl. But I think it's such a great snapshot of that specific experience and time, not just in terms of the fashion, but it's also just on a personal level so nostalgic for me because I was also a flailing 20 something year old in New York trying to figure out life and my career and also find an apartment that wasn't a sixth floor walk up. So I can relate to them more than I would care to admit. And number one cannot be beat when you're talking about 2010s fashion, the pinnacle is Pretty Little Liars. It is everything that we wished we could wear at that time, but heightened, you know, because it's very stylized. If One Tree Hill showed us how a cool teenager dressed in 2004 and Gossip Girl showed us how a cool teenager dressed in 2008, Pretty Little Liars taught us how a cool, rich, mystery-solving group of teenagers was supposed to dress in 2011. And like Girls and a lot of other shows, each girl kind of had their own style. You know, Spencer was very preppy. Emily's a little bit more edgy. Arya and Hannah are very trendy, but kind of in their own ways. But really, all of the characters on the show have really amazing fashion, and it's such a great representation of the ways that I wished I could dress at the time. So I think actually Pretty Little Liars will be next on my teen drama rewatch list if I ever manage to finish One Tree Hill. So if you are into early 2010 style, I will leave you here so that you can go watch these shows for inspiration. Thank you so much for joining me for another fun conversation. We know I love a good fashion trend discussion, so these are some of my favorite conversations. If you enjoyed this episode, I would so appreciate it if you would share it with a friend or someone else who might also enjoy it. I will be back next week, so I will talk to you then. Bye.